I'm David Orlovsky, and this is the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. And welcome to our special Rabbi Orlovsky Pesach program, where there will not be too much uh, swimming, aerobics, all those other exciting things that take place at Pesach programs. Just me. I mentioned uh, the last podcast, you know, I, I would love to do just the Pesach program, me and my family, and uh, talented, and bring people together and, and just have Pesach together, uh, make it really the Rabbi Olavsky Pesach program. But that would require me getting out of this chair. And uh, much like Thanos, I, I don't leave this chair. <laughs> For those who appreciate the reference, I used to read comic books when I was a kid. In any event, um, so uh, uh, we are in number 28 of our Rabbi Olavsky show, and this is number three of the special Pesach program. And whether you're listening on Torah anytime or wherever you listen to your podcast, we're happy to have you on board. And uh, I, I tell this story all the time. It's one of those stories I tell all the time. Um, many years ago, I was invited to be a uh, scholar in residence at a Pesach hotel. This was the Pesach hotel where my parents used to go. And, um, and they invited me to come. Uh, it was actually the year that my father passed away, and uh, I was asked to, you know, my mother wanted me to come, and so we made an arrangement, brought our family, which was much smaller at the time, and, uh, and we came. And I remember Erev Pesach, I have to tell you, I'm in a story in a story now, um, the greatest chinuch is done by doing, not by not by learning, not by sitting in a in a in a classroom. You could sit in a classroom and learn uh, the laws of shalach monas, and it's got to be two different brachas, and it has to be this, and you have to deliver it in through shliach. And uh, I grew up in North Merrick, Long Island. I have to tell you that Purim was not a major holiday in North Merrick, Long Island. Um, but uh, but my Rebbe, Rebbe Yaakov Well, decided to invite us over his house for a, a sort of a perm, an early Purim Suda. He lived in this uh, area of Brooklyn called Borough Park. Now, I had never been to Borough Park. You have to understand, I, grew, I was born in 1959. So if you lived in New York in the 60s and the 70s, it was known that if a boy from Long Island went to Manhattan, you had a life expectancy of about three minutes. Somebody would kidnap you, they would kill you, they would, you, you got off the Long Island Railroad, you took your life in your hands. That's the way it was. <laughs> so we tried to stay out of, the, out of the city. We tried to stay in the suburbs where it was safe, you know, with supervision, you could go to a mall, but that was about it. We were, we were terrified, yeah. So I never really, I, I would go with my father to his store in, in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn, Flappers and Forth. Midtown Florist and Nursery, Brooklyn's most fabulous florist. And uh, all the boys used to go in and help. I, um, I went in for a short period of time, and I, and I really just didn't have a gift for, for retail flower business. I don't know why. My brothers all made arrangements. They, uh, they all were able to do things. I, I, I didn't have a gift for this. I was the black rose of the family. Yeah? I, I would be sitting, I mean, on that, I hear my father go, David! <laughs> <laughs> what is this? You know, he took out a paper click and they were all like linked together, you know. <laughs> he told me once to take a piece of styrofoam and you stick in pins so, of different colors for corsages. So he says, you know, just put in the different boxes of pins into it. David! <laughs> no, I didn't know because I had never made uh, things. I had made a little mosaic. <laughs> <laughs> it was stuck all the way into the head. He goes, how am I supposed to pull it? Pit? I didn't know. You know. Anyway, after a while, he uh, he asked me if I would instead stay home and help my mother uh, instead of coming into the store, which I did. And I, I mastered the domestic skills much better than I did retail flower skills. And, um, uh, but, um, uh, so I'd been to my father's store in Brooklyn, but that was about it. I'd never been to Borough Park in my life. And, uh, we drive in, 
my friend's father drove us in. I listened to the Megillah in the shul there. And I see there's this yantif that I had never seen. I never saw it. I never heard of it. People are running around in costumes, delivering shalach manas. You know, it's like, it's, I had never seen it. Who, who, whoever saw Purim? And so it was, it, so I could read about it in a book from today to tomorrow. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, I was teaching in a Hebrew school. And uh, it was the Bar Bat Mitzvah class. And this was like the Agatha, Agatha Christie novel, Ten Little Indians, you know, where one by one people, you know, die off and disappear. Every time somebody would get bar mitzvah, that's it. They would, they would stop coming to the class. And uh, my, my class was dwindling. Um, in fact, this uh, priest, minister, and rabbi got together to discuss common communal problems. And uh, they were discussing structural problems in their buildings. And the priest said, look, we have a problem. We have bats in our belfry. And we don't know how to get rid of them. And the minister said, yeah, we have the same problem. We have church mice. And the rabbi says, you know, in the shul, uh, the attic, we had pigeons. But I got rid of them. He says, how'd you get rid of them? I chased them all into the shul. I gave them a bar mitzvah. They flew away. They never came back. <laughs> a sad story. But um, uh, so uh, they were disappearing. Now, the week before Pesach, the PTA told me, this is the budget to spend on your uh, model Seder. Now, if you've never seen a model Seder, my goodness, have you missed out on something. Uh, basically, we set the table. Ki'ilu, it's a Seder, as if it's the Seder night. We have grape juice instead of wine. And they have lettuce leaves. They have matzahs. And um, they have gefilte fish. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one kid is the grandfather, you know, sometimes he actually gets a, a little white beard to wear. Some little kid is the little kid who asks the Manish Tana, which I guess is cast typing, yeah? Um, typecasting, <laughs> my dyslexia. Anyway, um, and uh, someone's the mother, you know, it's a, they, and they act it out, you know, and they go through the steps of the Seder. Now, that's cute, second grade, third grade. These kids are in seventh grade. They're getting bar bat mitzvah already. They're disappearing. I'm going to make another model seder with them. You know, I have another lettuce leaf and a piece of filter fish. So I took my budget and the kids came in and they said, are we, uh, are we going to uh, have the model seder? Where's the model seder? I said, we're doing something different. Go to the bathroom, wash your hands with soap. Fine. They came back. And every two kids had a grater. I said, we're going to grade horseradish. They said, horseradish comes in a jar. I said, trust me, it doesn't. This is peeled horseradish, go ahead. They started, now any of us who grew up with Pesach, like I say, I didn't grow up in a Shema Shema's home, but we had Pesach, we had Pesach Seder. Now, you're grading the horseradish and you're, you, you're crying. <laughs> you wait till there's enough and you stick it in your brother's face. You know, these, are, these are some of the cultural things that that a Jew growing up in a house understands. They were very excited. I said, now go bring your, your graders to the bathroom, wash it out, now we're going to make charoses. And they made charoses by the traditional recipe, a piece for the grater, a piece for me, a piece of the, you know, apple for the grater, a piece for me, you know, and you're grating up the charoses, yeah. Um, I said, now we're going to wash the romaine lettuce. I said, what for? I said, for bugs. I'm going to check it for bugs. I said, there's no bugs. I said, let's see. Ugh, it's disgusting. I'm not eating lettuce again. Said, Fine, yeah. I brought in a little broiler. We broiled the eggs. We broiled the, the zraya. Kids who were not interested in anything came to life in that class like I had never seen. And we wrapped everything up. They said, can I use this at the Seder? I said, yes. Put it in the back of the refrigerator, you know, in the plastic bag. And just don't let it touch anything, you know. You have to grow up with it. Parenthetically, when people, uh, I had discussed this idea of making my own Orlovsky Pesach program for years, and, uh, and people said to me, what would you do? I said, well, one thing is, Erev Pesach, I would get ready for the Seder. I was at a very Choshava Pesach program under a very fine Hashgacha. And um, I, I went for two years. And the first year, I was shocked because at the, at the, at the table, you know, they give you a little kara. There wasn't enough lettuce to be able to have a, a romaine lettuce to be able to make a kazayas for everybody. So um, uh, I had to keep telling the waiter, bring more, bring more. He keeps bringing plates of lettuce. Yeah. Especially, 
you know, there's one shear for the stalks and one for the leaves, and most of my family likes the stalks, so this is a major undertaking. Anyway, the next year, Erev Pesach, I said, can I, can I go in the kitchen and prepare my own lettuce? They said, sure. So they had the pre-washed lettuce, etc., and I was cutting off the leaves and taking the stalks and measuring the kazasim and putting them into little bags. So I came to the table with my kazasim, like I always do. Um, so I said, I said, the activity, Erev Pesach, would be getting ready for Pesach. So I went to this hotel, and I was a scholar in residence, and they offered Erev Pesach, which you usually do Erev Pesach. There was swimming, there was tennis, there was the sauna was open, there was, you know, and they also had lectures. They had a class on napkin folding in front of the dining room. And also me. <laughs> I was also one of the options. And some people actually came, it was very nice. I said, we spend so much time preparing for the Seder. Or preparing for Pesach. If you stay home, there's all the cleaning and there's the shopping and there's the cooking and there's all the setting up. If you go away to a hotel, there's all the packing and all the schlepping. And it all comes down to the Seder. And tonight, there is a mitzvah for you to talk to your children and for your children to listen to you. Do you have anything you want to say? Have you given any thought to the Pesach Seder? Or are you going to say the same thing you said last year and five years ago and 10 years ago? Someone told me once there's what they talk about a lawyer with 10 years of experience or a lawyer with one year of experience 10 times. Just keep doing the same thing. Every person has to see himself as if he came out of Egypt. You know how difficult this is? And in order to do this, it's a struggle for us to find relevance. You know how hard it is to find a message that's going to have meaning in 2019? And especially if you're like me, where the people in your Seder span a whole range of ages, from little children to, lo- to older children to, to teenagers, preteens, teenagers, adults, 20-somethings, 30-somethings. And uh, you, you, have to, you have to engage. And you have to spend some time thinking about this. People just walk into the Seder and they, you know. It's an amazing thing to me. It was, it was, a, it was a life-changing experience for me. I have a daughter who goes every day to Slichos. Either she goes in the morning or she goes at night. And she came to me the first time and she says, Actually, she comes to me every year. And she says, could you go over the slichas with me? What do we say? What do we leave out? What do we skip? How do we say it? And I go through the slichas. It's a completely different experience. If you walk into slichas night and you've never opened up your slichas, you you, you try to remember from years past, it's not going to be meaningful to you. Try this. If, If you read through the slichas beforehand, it's an amazing thing. Shabbos Haggadah. This Shabbos, we're supposed to read the Haggadah. And it, it gives you a certain level of preparation going into the Seder, give you some thoughts. I, uh, I one year bought this uh, Haggadah, which basically has a paragraph and lines underneath for people to write in their own chidush. None of my kids did, nobody ever did, but it's, uh, it's a nice exercise just for yourself. One of the many divers that I have is I really want to put out my own Haggadah um, because it's, uh, uh, I want to have one where there's points that you can ask and make and try to be you know, meaningful to the people. And then I'll have bigger discussions in the back and have everything clear and it would be a spiral and laminated so you don't spill the wine all over it and stuff. This is one of the many projects that I, that I want to do. But, um, um, but I have to think beforehand when I'm walking into the Seder, what is the message I want to give across? What do I want to do? So uh, basically from now till Pesach, we're going to be giving you some helpful hints about the Seder and, and uh, setting things up. So let's start at the beginning. Start at the beginning. I said this yesterday, or two days ago. Yeah. Have 
a checklist. Know exactly what I need for the Seder. And the more preparation that you put into it, the better will be your experience. Here is the usual Pesach experience. Yeah, people go to shul. And if you have the minute at the end of davening, they say hello. And the person saying hello has all the time in the world. And then you have to say good yontif to everybody, and then you walk home, and then you come home. Now you got to chase everybody to the table. Now begins the fight over the seating. I want to sit over there. I want to sit over there. I want to sit next to Abba. I don't want to sit next to Abba. <laughs> I don't know. Arrangements. And then, until we work that all out. Yeah, it's, uh, the Paris Peace Accords is you know, trying to work out where everybody's going to sit. Fine. And then there's the actual fighting over the chairs because, you know, everybody wants to lean. And so, therefore, they need a pillow, you know, to lean against. But that only works with a chair with arms. And there's only two of them. And the Abba gets one. And so everybody's fighting over the remaining one. Yeah. And uh, then there's the fight over the pillows, because even people who don't have any arms, they want to have a pillow to recline on, even though if you have a straight back chair, I don't know what you're doing with it. But everyone's fighting. Why'd you take the pillow from my room? Take the pillow from your own room. No, I put back the pillow. <laughs> They're fighting over the pillows, right? Okay. Um, then begins the um, grape juice uh, wine discussion. Should I have wine? I don't know. I get sick when I have wine. It's really a little chatkila, certainly for the first cup. All right. Can I mix in grape juice? How much can I grape? Okay. You pour for me. I pour for you. Pour favor. Yeah. And everybody's pouring and trying to work this all out till we have that all done. Now we open up the matzahs. The search for the perfect matzah. I want it round. I want it whole. I don't want to crack. I don't want any holes in it. And each matzah has to be taken out and held up for personal examination. <laughs> Until that is all done, you set up your three uh, matzahs. All right? And people make kiddush. Everybody makes kiddush. Even people who are not such good kiddush makers make kiddush. Yeah. And uh, then we go to the manish tana. And everybody says Manish Tano, they say it in Hebrew, they say it in English, they say it in Yiddish, they say it in Swahili, they say it in Spanish, they say it in French, yeah. And now we finally get down to the Seder. And if you're lucky enough to have a Yeshiva Bacha, he pulls out his first box of notes and starts going into a beautiful Reb Chaim about Chomets and Matzah, and uh, so it's a beautiful Brisa Chakira, you know, and it ties in to the Kompesach and Kodshim and yeah, and at some point, you realize your Seder is in trouble. Yeah. You know the Seder is in trouble when the father begins assigning roles to the four sons. Russia, Mahu Omer. <laughs> so there's somebody designated unofficially. Maybe it's an uncle, maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's a kid who goes, that's it, let's go. How do you know there were 10 places in the city? 10 places, 50 places, 50 places, 60 places, 200 places, 250 places, sold. Raman Gamli Oymer, anyone who doesn't understand these three things are not Yossi Dei Chavaso. And then we come to the eating part, which we have waited for. And you'll be surprised, by this point, even a piece of cardboard matzo looks good to you, yeah? And the father starts breaking off, trying to get a kazayas, with a combination from the top and the middle matzah for every person, which is impossible. Impossible. So either you make sure everybody has their own three matzahs, can do their own little, uh, little process there, or you do what some people do, which is they measure, they pre-measure out the matzah and they put it in little plastic bags, and they distribute them to everybody, along with a little piece of the hamotzi matzah. And uh, this way you know that you have a shir. And then come tomorrow, and we start the whole um, measuring process again. And we, then you have the fight over the stalks and the leaves. Yeah. And, and we move along, and by the time we get to the meal, everybody's saying, we got to gotta, gotta move it along. I don't know that we're maximizing the Seder experience when we do it that way, in my opinion. 
It's always bothered me. Someone told me a story about a guy who comes to Volozhin. And the first night he goes to Reb Chaim's Seder, a real brisk Seder. And they sit down, they bring out three burnt matzahs, yeah. And uh, they spend the whole time saying Divrei Torah and Divrei Torah. And finally, they look at them, oh, got to go. They quickly eat the enormous share of burnt matzah, you know, and then they use real chrein for the, for the, for the murrah, you know. And, and then uh, they have a little bit of soup. And they're, oh, oh they're time for avikom, and they eat the avikom. And then they sit and say Divrei Torah the whole night. That was his first seder. Second seder, he went to the Nitziv. Three white, beautiful matzahs, and everybody's sitting around and smiling, a lot of singing, things moved along very nicely, they had a beautiful suda, yeah. So the person who told me the story, I said, so who's right? He says, I don't know, but which seder would you rather go to? And that, to my mind, encapsulates what you have to do when you're planning your seder. Which seder would you like to go to? Yeah, would you enjoy that? What say would you enjoy? How do you? And now let's extend it a step further. What seda would your kids like to go to? So, someone told me that they went to Dov Schwartzman's seda, Yeshiva based Talmud, and uh, he tried asking kashi, prepared kashi all night. He's sitting there with his children, his grandchildren, and they're singing and they're telling stories, you know, and he keeps throwing nuts out to the children, you know. <laughs> and every now and then I would ask Akash and he would say, I don't know, have a nut. <laughs> and that was the focus of the Seder. It was, it was a great time. He says, but I didn't get to ask all my Akash. Yeah. Somebody told me they went to a Seder with Ramesha Shapiro and the whole Seder He's talking to the children. And he's telling them Midrashim and he's telling them stories, etc. You know. He finished well before Chatzois. And then he said Shir Shirim and he said and learned the rest of the night. But the Seder itself was was not only kid friendly, but kid centric. So I told the story to somebody and they said, Yeah, yeah, Rav Hutna was the same thing. That's what his Seder was like. So this is the question. And and Sof Masa Mahshavat Khila. If you want your Seder to be something that's going to be enjoyable, then it requires planning and thought. And you can't sit down at the Seder night and open up your Haggadah without ever having looked at it and decide what am I going to do with this and how am I going to run this thing. I need preparation. Okay, you have to set up the Seder plate. How do you set up the Seder plate? If Hanach Leibowitz, Rashiva Chavetz Chaim, was here in Eretz show. Someone called up. Rebetzin was blocking the calls. Zerv Pesach. Says, uh, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> so I have to talk to the Rashiva. Yeah, why? What do, you, what do you want to ask him? I want to ask how he sets up his Seder plate. He opens up the Haggadah and looks at the picture like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so think beforehand. Here's a tidbit if you haven't picked this up by this point because, you know, I don't know how it works in America, you know, but in... But in uh, Eitzel, you go from your parents to your in-laws, your parents to your in-laws, your parents to your in-laws, and you keep doing this until, you know, you already have your own grandchildren and they're expecting to come to you. <laughs> your own married kids. <laughs> so there are people that will make Pesach, yeah? Uh, when you want to, um, you want to broil the egg, uh, boil it first. <laughs> Otherwise, if you just take it and put it on the fire, it has a tendency to explode. This is the voice of experience coming to you through the years, yeah? Boil it first. Um, I, I told you, you know, you make your list of, of preparations for the Seder. Uh, some people have the minug of eating an egg. That's the first thing they have. There's a lot of reasons for this. People eat an egg. So we quickly, you know, Erev Pesach, I know, because I don't have that many pots, right? You don't have as many pots in Pesach as you do during the year. So, um, so you make a cheshman. How many, uh, how many eggs do I need? Right, I have a Seder. I've got uh, 18 people at the Seder. I need 18 eggs, right? Excellent. Make 26. Yud Kei Vav Kei. Go from Chai to Yud Kei Vav Kei. Why? Because they have Pesach. People are going to be eating your eggs. <laughs> Don't kid yourself and think that they won't. So make sure you have the eggs. Yeah. 
Um, salt water. I spoke once with uh, Rabbi Zachary Wallerstein for Rabbi Pinchas Wallerstein uh, for Yeshiva or Yitzchak. They were they made a pre Pesach program. He mentioned that you in America you can buy salt water. Here in Israel, you know, we're behind the times. We have to make our own salt water. We take water and we add salt, mix it up, and that's salt water. Um, And uh, make sure you have that. Make sure you have your carpas. What's your carpas? What is your carpas? Um, My father used onion. I went to day school. They said, you can't use onion. You have to use parsley. Use parsley. I came home. I said, Dad, we have to use parsley. He says, that parsley, my father used onion. I said, no, we have to use parsley. He said, parsley. So it was one of his moments of compromise. I, I, he must have been getting old. But we put out onion and parsley. Years later, I found in the Haggadah of Abionis and Eipschitz, where he says, for uh, karpas, you should use onion. And there are those who use parsley. And that's ridiculous, because nobody eats parsley, so you wouldn't even make a barbary adam on it. <laughs> So, you know, my dad, I, I found over the years that what my bu- dad knew, he knew. Yeah. My father used potatoes because that was the closest they had in a lot of Eastern Europe to a green vegetable. Sometimes the potatoes themselves were green, yeah. And uh, that's what they did. Uh, we went to my in-laws for the Pesach Seder for years and we moved to Eretzvel, we made our first Seder. And I put out onion, like my father did. And so everybody drank a cup of wine, ate a piece of onion, they all threw up, spent the rest of the Seder night on the couch as I sang joyfully. <laughs> so, and after that year, we switched to my father's minug, which is potato. So I put out potato and I put out onion. I don't know what it is to use. Um, those are minugim. Lefiani is daiti. The best thing to use would be celery. That's what I think. If you don't have a minug, that's my advice. Because it's supposed to be like an appetizer. And at fancy affairs, they actually put out celery sticks that you can dip in salt water. So it doesn't get any better than that. And it's green, and it's adama. And before the meal, it's perfect. Someone told me that Rabbi Yosheb Salavechik used to use strawberries. He says, why? He says, because the whole point of karpas is to get the children to ask, what's what more... Unusual in taking a strawberry, making it by rare dumb and dipping it in salt water. Very little. Uh, more unusual than that. So, um, so that's the way that he would, uh, that he would do it. But um, whatever it is, you have to make sure your carpas is set up. Uh, when you grate your, if you're using horseradish, you grate your mora, make sure that you have it in a sealed container so it does not lose its power. If you're using romaine lettuce, again, Cut off the leaves from the stems for the people who want the stems, the people who want the leaves, measure it out, and put it uh, in little bags. And at some point during the Seder, before you get to Mara, people should say, you have two kazesim, one for Mara and one for Kairach. We make your little sandwich. So you say, do you want leaves? you want stalks? you want two stalks? you want two leaves, one of each? And just distribute all your bags before you get started. Going to make your charoses. Now... I don't know why, when I was growing up, we had one thing of charoses, we had one thing of salt water. In my Seder, I got a whole bunch of them all around the table. I'm going to sit there and wait while we pass around the salt water on the table. No, here you go, five bowls of, everyone dip as much as you want. Here's a bowl, five bowls of charoses, everybody just dip. Dip your heart out, yeah, not a problem. Um, you make sure Yisraya is, Yisraya, <laughs> When I was growing up, it says a shank bone. I, to this day, don't know what a shank bone is. Whenever I'd ask the butcher for a shank bone, he always gave me a, a piece of uh, spare rib. And he says, yeah, yeah, it's a it's really <laughs> Some people use a chicken wing. Some people use a chicken foot. These are obviously wrong because my father didn't do it. Okay. So anyway, it's a piece of meat with a bone and it's roasted. And that's what you're supposed to have there. Zechel, the uh, uh, carbon Pesach. Yeah. And uh, you have everything all set up, and make sure that this is set up beforehand. Yeah. So as much as you can beforehand prepare, prepare. We have the fight of where everyone's going to sit, Erev Pesach. And we bring everybody together, we have everyone fight over their seats, 
And then I make place cards and I put them on the table. So when we get there, you know where you're sitting. The more preparation there is, the better it's going to be. We're going to continue this in our next podcast of how to make a successful Seder. And uh, that's it for today. I usually say that's it for this week, but uh, this, we've got a whole bunch of them. It's every two days. That's it for these Yomayim. There's no word in Hebrew, in English for two days. Yeah, In Hebrew, we have Yomayim. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you want information on the show, please go to rabbiolowski.com slash podcast. If you want information on this particular show, please go to rabbiolowski.com slash podcast slash 28. If you want to know about upcoming events, rabbiolowski.com slash events. If you want to contact me, it's rabbiolowski.com slash contact. And if you would like to sponsor a podcast, imagine the wonderful thing you're doing for Klai Yisrael. It's rabbiolowski.com slash podcast and click on sponsor an episode. I'm Rabbi Olavsky. This is the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Mm-hmm.